Hello, and thank you for joining me. Um, today we're going to be going through 2 Samuel chapter 11. And the one blot on David's life that um, actually ends up revealing yet another part of his character, his high character. Um, so this is going to be the sin with Bathsheba in two messages, um, part one and part two. And uh, let's stop and pause, rather, and ask God to add his blessings to the reading and teaching of his word. Heavenly Father, we love you. We thank you so much for this day and all the blessings. We thank you for good times and bad times. We thank you for ups and downs. We thank you for uh, happiness and suffering. We thank you for trials and tribulations, what they produce. We don't thank you for the trials and tribulations, but we thank you for what they produced. And we ask you, God, that you would be watching over church leaders around the world, missionaries, church planners, um, and definitely uh, all the people in our born-again churches here in America. And we just ask that you would watch all over, watch over all of us and provide and help us to glorify you in all that we do. Okay. Verse 1. And it came to pass after the year was expired at the time when kings go to battle that David sent Joab and his servants with him and all Israel and they destroyed the children of Ammon and besieged Rabbah. But David stayed at Jerusalem. And it came to pass in an evening that David rose from off his bed, couch, and walked upon the roof of the king's house. And from the roof he saw a woman washing herself, and the woman was very beautiful to look upon. And David sent and asked after the woman, and one said, Is not this Bathsheba the daughter of Eli, the wife of Uriah the Hittite? And David sent messengers and took her, and she came in unto him, and he lay with her, for she was purified from her uncleanness, and she returned unto her house. And the woman conceived, and sent, and told David, and said, I am with child. Okay, well, before I say anything else, let me say this to the scoffers who are out there who love to debate, denounce, criticize, condemn, and belittle the authority and the authentic nature of the scriptures. You are absolutely in error in your ways. And I say this because of one fundamentally important fact. Any religion, really any religion except Christianity, is not going to have this passage in its scriptures about its heroes and founders. You are not going to find a story about adultery. You're a hero of the faith. And even if some of them do have some things similar to this, you certainly can't bring this charge against the Bible that it's just good stuff about the people in the Bible. David is called a hero, a man after God's own heart. Here is one thing in propaganda that we do not do, 
And that is we do not include passages of Scripture that talk about the big sins of the heroes of the faith. It wouldn't be in here. But this speaks to God. He doesn't need your approval. He doesn't need to hide anything because he's God. He doesn't need to authenticate himself. He has this passage of scripture put into his word because he doesn't have anything to hide or to prove. Why else would this be in here? If this is a book of propaganda, then why would it be in here? Ask yourself that question. It is in here because God has nothing to hide, He has nothing to prove, and He doesn't need to authenticate Himself. His word, His book, contains the good, the bad, and the ugly. Because the purpose of this book is not to prove himself to you. Well, I mean, in a sense it is because he has to have a record of who created the world and who has the authority so that you have the opportunity to accept it or reject it. So that way he has done his part to start the conversation of where you're going to spend eternity in heaven or in hell. Outside of that, no. Because his desire is that all men be saved. And he fulfilled that responsibility when he wrote this book. Outside of giving you a life preserver for you to choose to grab a hold on to or push your way and drown, which just popped into my head, but that's a brilliant analogy. Okay, so... He doesn't have to prove himself to anybody. The purpose of this book is to show Jesus that he came to save the world. He came to save sinners. And this also illustrates how when we've been caught in sin, how we repent and humble ourselves and return back to Him and get forgiveness, which is the Gospel. So, and even in this third chapter, and even in this third verse, one of the people is saying, gosh, you know, is it right for Him to be asking about this woman? She's married, so is He. So then we get into the nitty-gritty of David's sin. It goes even deeper. He sent to Joab saying, Send me Uriah the Hittite. And Joab sent Uriah to David. And there is ample evidence in this chapter that this man knows, knows and is justified by faith. So, David's committed a great sin here. But he tries to cover it up. And let's, let's look at this all from the caveat that this is one of David's mighty men, Uriah. One of his valiant warriors who David knows pretty well, probably helped him all those years that he was running from Saul. He knows that this man is a man of God. But initially, he tries to fix the problem with no further damage by having Uriah come back. Gives him an opportunity to have relations with her, Bathsheba, so that David can, so that they can, he can assume that the child is his. Swept under the rug, no marriage. Everybody's, everybody's good. David is trying to end the relationship with Bathsheba. He is trying to end this right here and now without any further damage. But Uriah, being a man after God's own heart, refuses to go in. And there even followed him a mess of meat from the king. But Uriah slept at the door, 
of the king's house with all the servants of his lord and went not down to his house when they had told David saying Uriah went not down into his house David said unto Uriah camest thou not from thy journey why then didst not thou go down to thine own house and Uriah said unto David the ark and Israel and Judah abide in tents and my lord Joab and the servants of my lord are encamped in the open fields. Shall I then go into my house to eat and drink and to lie with my wife? As thou livest and as thou thy soul liveth, I will not do this thing. And David said to Uriah, Tarry here today also and tomorrow I will let thee depart. So, that the, so Uriah abode in Jerusalem that day and the morrow and when David had called him he did eat and drink before him and he made him drunk and even he went out to lie on his bed with the servants of his Lord but went not down to his house so here we have even when Uriah is drunk his principles stay with him he will not go down to his house this is a man of very high character like David up until this point where he shows that he has a blemish in his character. And David's first two attempts were to fix the problem by having Uriah go lie with his wife. Twice now Uriah refuses. So we have two people who are of good character here. One who has fallen into a huge sin that's about to get worse. And another one who has no cognizance. So, David writes in a letter saying, Set your right in the forefront of the hottest battle and return ye from him that he may be smitten and die. And it came to pass when Joab observed the city, he assigned Uriah unto a place where he knew that the valiant men of Ammon would be. And the men of the city went out and fought with Joab. And there fell some of the people of the servants of David. And Uriah the Hittite also died. And also here, several other godly men who were fighting with Uriah died. So David's not only guilty of killing Uriah, but also several of his men. And Joab sent and told David all the things according concerning the war, and charged the messenger, saying, When thou hast made an end of the telling of the matters of the war unto the king, and if it so be that the king's wrath arise, and he say unto thee, Wherefore approached ye so nigh unto the city, when ye did fight, knew ye not that they would shoot from the wall? Who smote Ahimelech, Abimelech, son of Jerobisheth, did not a woman cast a piece of millstone upon him from the wall that he died in Thebes? Why went ye nigh the wall? Then say, Thou, thy servant Uriah the Hittite, is dead also. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to stop. And we're going to pick up this message in the second part so that we can finish the reading of this passage and then go into further detail into what exactly is going on here spiritually and how to apply it to our lives.